welcome back everyone. This will be our last panel of the day and then we will have our end of program. Um, so this is our, our last but not least panel. Um, and we have our panel moderated by Dr. Hyatt Alvey. And this is another faculty development panel. Uh, Dr. Alvey is an associate professor in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval War College. She has served as the Director of International Studies at Arcadia University, and she has taught political science at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. She has published numerous books and articles, including her latest book, Nonviolent Activism in Islam, The Message of Abu Kalam Azad. Please welcome uh, Dr. Alvi and her panel. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be asked to moderate this esteemed panel. And I want to thank Dr. Saira Yamin for inviting me and congratulations on a great symposium. So I will not be reading any bios. I encourage you to look at the program and read the bios of our esteemed panelists. We're going to begin with Mr. Robert Gussentine. Sir, the floor is yours. down. Uh, it's 1500. I'm going to have to ask you to participate. We have to participate and we're going to die. We're all going to die here. So I, I, uh, um, I, I'm a retired Navy captain. I, uh, I run a course in, in the swamp in Mississippi on a NASA base for partner nation officers, diplomats, and government officials. No U.S. participation. Uh, it's fantastic. Our, our key objective is, get to, is getting them to see, see something different. Can you see the world around you differently? And we don't shovel what the U.S. offers. We don't say, here's, here's what we got to offer, here's from the U.S., and here's what you get. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I tell them in the beginning, we're going to create something together. We're going to create this together. Every class is different. Uh, and so we go in with that mindset that we're going to do this together. So it really patterns itself well on at 1500 on in the afternoon uh, after lunch. And you've got, you know, traffic and the whole thing for you to participate. So I'm going to ask you to do that at certain points. Uh, and I'll start out with with um, any army folks in here. Oh, holy smoke. Uh, so FM6, Mission Command, right? FM6, Mission Command is is a, a, a doctrinal pub in the army and it says that leaders do three things leaders uh visualize they describe and they direct that's what it says that's what army doctrine says uh, we say in our course we visualize communicate and direct first you have to be able to visualize you have to be able to see what's going on you have to understand your environment if you don't understand your environment uh, you will make decisions about things you don't understand, and you'll waste time and resources and opportunities, and none of us can afford to do that on an operation. And so we start with what we can see. Are we seeing the world, this changing dynamic world we're involved in, do we see it properly? Are we seeing it in a way that's advantageous to us and our country and our national security? And I say maybe. And uh, from what I heard this morning in the Pringle Auditorium, we have blind spots. One of those is women, peace, and security. And so we have other blind spots, but this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Muhammad Iqbal, of course, is, a, is, is very famous as a scholar, a poet. Uh, uh, the, the, the souls, uh, uh, the father of pa pa Pakistan, right? Uh, and uh, and a wonderful poet. And we use in our course a lot of poetry, a lot of literature. We use painting. Uh, visual art uh, to communicate and make ideas and concepts sticky. And we do it to open their minds to new ideas. It's, it, it, it seems to work for us. I won't offer that as a pedagogic pedagogy for you, however it's pronounced. But I want to I want to share what we do uh, down in Stennis, Mississippi, with uh, 20 uh, or so. Uh, partner nation officers, diplomats, and government officials three times a year. We do a third, it's a 30 day course. And uh, nations are born in the hearts of poets. They prosper and die in the hands of politicians. 
Uh, Thornton Wilder, a U.S. playwright, wrote a play called Our Town. Anybody know Our Town? Know this? Know the play? We skip Act One and Act Two. Go to Act Three. Emily, who's in the play, has died, and Emily is 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 had a chance to look back at her life on her twelfth birthday, and so she asked the stagehand, stage manager rather, who's a character in the play. Um, do people ever really see life when they when they live it? Do they actually realize life in its full measure when they live? And he says, well, the poets and the saints, maybe. And so with that answer, we lean heavily on poetry in the class. Um, and I have a I have a poem for you today that I'll read if we have time. Uh, but I'm going to move quickly uh, to to this uh, beautiful idea called Women, Peace and Security. Uh, this is the U.S. strategy. My take on this strategy is written here. And the strategy, as far as I've read it, and this is not the DOD, of course, but this is the, the, the national strategy, is outward looking. It is for partner nations. It is for what we do overseas. And so it, it works well in our class for us to, uh, to incorporate it. Leonardo da Vinci, to develop a complete mind, study the science of art, study the art of science, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. Again, we introduce art because art allows our brains three important uh, neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin that opens our minds up, creates trust, and prepares us to learn. And so we use art in the class. Um, when you view a piece of art, you have to, a piece of visual art like a painting, you have to look at the, the painting uh, in its entirety and understand what that painting is about. Our mind uh, creates a thought, and we have to be able to express the thought. And that's what we get into in our class is understanding our environment and expressing our thoughts in, in creative and sticky ways. Here's, uh, here's a little bit about our course, um, our why, to challenge our understanding of the world and together create new methods for thinking and going about our work in the 21st century. Our key goal, strategic awareness, not omniscience, but as best we can, never again be fully taken by surprise. Be able to think big and small, fast and slow, able to think systemically, and be willing to do the hard, tedious work of understanding. That's our course. That's our goal. And we do that for uh, 0.7 women per year. We get about, about one, one uh, that's, our, that's our average so far. U.S. SOCOM is going to help us fix that. Um, yeah. Uh, but I looked at your mission. Um, here's your mission statement. I looked at it, and I, and I started to draw some things that seem to align with what we do. And the Naval, the Naval, War, College deliver, uh, Naval uh, War College delivers the mental strength and flexibility to outthink competitors. It delivers cognitive advantage, which I think is fantastic. It's a fantastic thing uh, for you to see as your mission. We're going to give our men and women and the men and women of our partner nations cognitive advantage. Um, I know these are people familiar to you. In the War College, I know you teach from this. Uh, Frederick the Great, the Kadoi, the be able to see things at a glance, to understand them, generate a comprehensive understanding at a glance, and Clausewitz, you teach that here. I know you do. I've, re I've seen your books. I've seen your papers and your articles. Uh, <clears throat> these two gentlemen um, have, are talking to us about seeing the battlefield. How do we see it? When all is said and done, it really is the commander's Kadoi who is ability to see things simply to identify the whole business of war completely with himself. That is the essence of good generalship. To see things, to see things simply, to identify the whole business of war. And that's what we're going to talk about briefly this morning, because I've got about 17 or, or, or excuse me, uh, I got uh, about uh, 10 minutes left. We're going to talk about the whole business of war, which includes women, peace, and security. 
what the research says. This is what the, 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 uh, the document provides us, this research. And so participation starts now. So you have, we're going to read these together. These three things we're going to read together. Are you ready? Ready? I'm going to hear it out loud, okay? We're going to read this together. Number one, peace negotiations. Come on, we, we can do this. Happy hour's coming. You gotta, you're going to have to turn on here. Peace negotiations are more likely to succeed and result in lasting stability when what? Women participate. Number two, women and girls are often targeted for various forms, exploitation and abuse. Oftentimes, their physical vulnerability can be directly traced back to their politically disadvantaged place in society. And number three, social and political marginalization of women strongly correlates with the likelihood that a country will experience conflict, the research says. That's the why of it all. So this document, looking out, we have this. We are starting to see the whole business of war. And women have a place in it. So I will tell you, this is not a document uh, that's instructing us to be nice. It's not, a, in this sense, it's not about compassion or being fair. This is about war. It's about winning wars. Sustaining the peace. It's not about winning battles that we said up front. You want to win a battle, I'll grab, you know, you, you want to go to a bar fight, I'm going to grab a bunch of guys here and go. Maybe Ebony, but I'm going to, right, I'm going to, I'm going to grab a bunch of guys, we're going to go to a bar fight. If I want to sustain the peace, if I want to win the war, it says we need women to participate. That's important. Art can help us. It helps us in our course, open up minds on ramps to new ideas. Aristotle, art is born when many of the bits of information derived from an experience, the whole business of war. Uh, and from that emerges a grasp of those similarities, similarities in view of which they are a unified whole. The whole business of war comes together Poiesis, right? Aristotle, thinking, how thoughts are formed, how we create thought. And there's a spot between the time we see a tree and the time our brain tells us we've recognized it as a tree. And there's a, there's a thing in between, and that's where we generate thought. Meaning comes from in between. I perceive a tree here, and of course we see with our minds. So seeing is a cognitive activity. You give students, it says, we give the force, the joint force, cognitive what? Advantage. This is about thinking. You're in the business of thinking, generating and building thinkers for the 21st century. That's your job. That's your mission statement. People have, who have a cognitive advantage. Aisha Kamal, I've, I've certainly leaned on Pakistan here a little bit. A beautiful calligraphist out of Pakistan. I try to emphasize the message of the Quran through my art. I believe that your soul connects to a mystery as soon as you observe a piece of calligraphy. Uh, whether or not you can understand that or not. Whether or not you can understand it. This is, this is of course, uh, uh, verses from the, uh, from the Quran, right? Beautiful calligraphy. Beautiful. So this idea that art has a special place in learning um, is, is not something that uh, is exclusive to uh, our course. And it, it, it's a way of thinking, of course, and, and the Chinese and the Sun Dynasty, you see on the left, there's a little bit of information, talked about the three perfections. And we're thinking about Chinese thinking. I think there should be, I think there should be a, an intelligence discipline for art. Let's look at their art and tell something about those people. So the Chinese, uh, back in the day, uh, used three forms of artistic uh, expression, poetry, calligraphy, and painting. And that came together to be called the three perfections. And it was, to them, it was the, the fullest expression of an idea. Something I had perceived in nature here, it's a natural setting. Uh, something common to this uh, type of painting is uh, there is a, the same level of detail in many parts of the painting that is not true in Western art. It is not as, as, as common in Western art. They think everything has value. I see the whole picture, Gus. And in Western art, there's usually a focus. If you look at Van Gogh's sunflowers, guess what the focus is? The sunflowers. 
right? Those ideas, even the Hudson School, they had they had something for us to look at. And so in the in Chinese painting here back in, uh, in uh, the Song Dynasty, we see that every part, the whole business of this thought is incorporated almost to the same value, almost to the same value. Is that important? The three perfections. General Krulak, any Marines in here? So um, General Krulak, 1999, writes this article, The Three Block War. How many times have you said the three block war and the strategic corporal in your life, your military lifetime? A thousand times, right? A thousand times at least. We say that. We quote that all the time. He wrote the article. His, his, the, the whole crust of the, of the article is we're concentrating on combat operations. And guess what? Warfare is not synchronous, right? It doesn't happen. Uh, we go to phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. It doesn't happen that way. Everything happens at once. And that was Krulak's lesson to us. It happens all at once. Humanitarian assistance, peacekeeping, and warfighting all at the same time. There's no focus on combat operations. We have to take care of everything. We have to see and deal with the whole business of war to be successful. Not just the stuff I like to do. Not just the stuff I was trained to do. Tank battalions, Bosnia, Herzegovina, right? Doing tank battalions, doing what? Monitoring voting booths. Not just the stuff I was trained to do as a U.S. Navy SEAL. This is stuff I have to do to be successful, right? So Krulak told us this in, uh, in this article. It's nonlinear. It's the whole business of war that we have to be working on at the same time. Uh, I gave a brief, uh, and, or I, I met with the uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence staff in 2006. We were, we were discussing something up in, up in Fairfax uh, that... Uh, um, or other officers that uh, um, that we're all interested in. At the end of the briefing, I said, it looks like to me that your remit, your burden, your challenge for the IC, the intelligence community, was that everything everywhere matters all the time. Not everything's important, but everything matters. In a close or semi-closed system, remember now Joint Doctrine has systems design, right? In a, in a closed or semi-closed system, Everything affects everything else. That's the nature of, 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 uh, of complex systems. So Krulak's telling us that we have to pay attention to the whole business of war, and we have to see it differently. Uh, last, last, uh, uh, my last couple of slides here. Uh, this is an article um, about Haiti after the, uh, after the earthquake. And uh, you can see the title. And I would ask you, and this could be any military force, it just happens to be one on the UN. But I would ask you, what's the impact of peacekeepers going down to the gate? And I, I had a discussion with, uh, with our, our uh, I call them my companions in the course, about their experiences with this sort of thing. And, and roughly, it's the, 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 the troopers go down to the gate. And engage and and and, and uh, barter for a, a price for for entertainment, for having sex with the women, right? And 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 some of the some of the folks, my companions, would say, well, yeah, and, and the families even bring the, the the women, the young women, to the gate. That's the nature of this this messy stuff we're in. And so we moved the conversation on. There were two female officers in the class. And it made it for a very, very interesting discussion. And I know you know the Malian Dialogue. We're very famous. Then what's the great line? Anyone? Can anyone give me the great line out of the Malian Dialogue? The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. Right? Athens to Malos. So uh, what, what's the impact here? If the strong are going down to exploit, what's the impact on the individual? The trooper. The troop, right? What's the impact? What's the impact on the unit? Especially if they have women in the unit. What's the impact? How about the mission? How about the family? How about the country? How about the UN? The reputation. The trust, legitimacy, reputation, the moral injury that we incur, right? 
This is the whole business of war. It's just not lasers and cyber and pointy ends of ships. It's the whole messy stuff. And we have to be able to see it all. We have to be able to see it all. And that's learning to see. Um, anyone have uh, someone ever break trust with them? Anyone? Somebody break a promise, break trust? Yeah, I know. We all raise our hand. Uh, I'll just give you a secret. Your relationship will never be the same. That's the power of trust. That's the injury, right? So if, if uh, we lose trust in a unit, how does that work? Ma'am, do you have a... Okay, I'm going to try to hurry. Uh, so the whole business of war, we have to learn to see it. It includes women. It includes their, their participation uh, in all the ways we've heard about this morning, both in positions of authority and influence, and also their, um, their consideration as uh, potential uh, victims of exploitation. Okay, Gus, we get it. So what are we up against? Well, you're up against this, right? This is what you're, this is what you're building people to take care of, to handle this stuff, right? Everything here. And it's not just this stuff, this world that's, that's spinning around us. It's all the changes that these things create. They generate change that multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. And you're supposed to be building the people who can handle this, right? The leaders. Well, they have to see the whole business of it, the whole business of war, the great game layered on top. What's the one on top, ma'am? Commander, what's the one on top? Chat BT, uh, GPT, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, anarchy. These two guys thought when, uh, uh, people have different ways of thinking. Fantastic, uh, John Stuart Mill and, and Isaiah Berlin. Um, we need people who can think differently uh, about the whole business of war. And I'll end with this. Uh, and I, I picked this because it was, it, one, it works very well as a poem. Uh, it's the kind of thing we do in class. Uh, it's Menning Wall. It's done up here. It was north out of the North Boston series of poems that Robert uh, Frost uh, wrote. Very famous line, like the Malian Dialogue quote, right? We love to we love to talk about uh, good fences make good neighbors. Like we 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 love to say that. Uh, here's the last stanza, and here's what I want to take away from this poem. Poems can teach us. Poets can can illuminate things, they see things we don't see. But this is how I kind of use this thing in, in class. In each hand, like an old stone savage armed, he moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father saying. And he likes having thought of it so well. He says again, good fences make good neighbors. We can't, we can't walk away from old ideas, right? We want to clutch those things, these traditions. He does. He will not go behind his father's saying. He clutches onto that. And so the thing we try to move our companions into are the people who participate in our class is be prepared to move away from where you are. Be ready for new ideas. Uh, be curious, generate and uh, feed your imagination and be ready to become the leaders your countries, their countries need them to be. And that includes learning to see the whole business of war, which includes women. Thank you very much. We will now open the floor for Q&A. And I, Mitzi, please go ahead. Dr. Mitzi McFade, I'm a faculty member at the Center for Naval Warfare Studies and Analysis, which is across the airbridge over there. Um, sir, you had a very nice picture of uh, General Krulak up there, uh, the 31st Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I would like to ask you about General Krulak's best friend. Mm. And they met in 1953, and this mysterious best friend died, and Krulak gave the eulogy at the funeral. And who was this mysterious man? You know him well, because you teach him in your course. It was Ted Geisel. Uh otherwise known as Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so I would like, I have, I have prior knowledge. Yeah, right. 
I'm not just guessing. Um, I'd love to hear you talk about that and how that fits in with your general uh, pedagogical philosophy about understanding the world in its entirety as necessary for warfare. Thank you for that question. Uh, I, have, I have some backup slides. But please, ma'am, tell me when, I'm, when we're going along, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, you're, Dr. You're I'm okay. Okay. Oh, this is my last slide. I'm sorry. Uh, the note on the left, though. The note on the left. I want you to see that the whole point is I'm going to point to the left so you see the note. Uh, I believe that about strategies. Um, I did all look at all this work. I just it's just all back, back, backup stuff. All right. There's our course. Uh, I can't. Is, uh, here we go. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, we use this in the course. It's the only course book we have. <laughs> and and just as they talked about in the last panel, you have to have things that are sticky. And this sticks. And they take it back. And, I mean, now the word's out, right? They're hey, going to get one of these at graduation. And the point is, it would be incomplete if they did not receive it. They're anxious to get that thing in their hands. And uh, they take it back and, and you know, I've seen it in, their, in pictures in their offices. They've got it prominently displayed next to the whatever, right? Um, but they're very proud of them. Uh, the Cat in the Hat, of course, is a, a story about chaos. If you know the story, uh, kids are in, um, inside, it's raining, and uh, mom's gone, and they, uh, uh, they're bored. The cat comes in, chaos ensues. Messed up the house. Oh, oh, mom's coming back, and the cat says, "Well, I can fix this, right?" And uh, and the cat um, comes in with this car with lots of arms on it, right, to pick up the house and get away. But right as mom's walking, boom, okay. Uh, cat and hat comes back, relatively the same story. Cat comes in, and it's a great, it's a great um, depiction in very simple terms about wicked problems, where one problem you try to solve one problem and you create two more, right? And in this story, what happens? Well, the, you know, he's eating the cake in the bathtub and there's a ring in the bathtub. Then he grabs mom's dress and he cleans up this. Now mom's dress is messed up and he keeps going on. Okay, so the problems multiply. And uh, and then uh, he comes in with uh, pretty soon pink. It's pink snow and, and the whole world's pink. And mom's coming home and um, he has to, you know, cat comes back in. Well, I've got all these cats and it won't go to. But anyway, the last cat is cat Zed. And it has Voom, right? And Voom is magical, and it cleans everything up. And Mom comes in, everything's clean. And go, and she goes, and, and the story ends. The point is, I, I we, and I haven't read it in class. And it's a fantastic photo. You can imagine the image we capture. You know, they're in there with their with their uniforms on, and they got the cat in the hat open, and they're reading, and I get great pictures, you know. And uh, and I said, well, I'm not going to send these back until you get home. You know, I'm not going to send these back to the guys I know in your country because uh, if, if these get out, no one's going to understand what in the world, you know, you spent money to come here to do this for. So um, the cat in the hat, the cat in the hat comes back. Uh, the storyline here is a classical uh, storyline from literature and Shakespeare. Everybody uses this, right? Uh, you have uh, the story begins and you have conflict is, is introduced and then you have in increasing complexity or trouble or problems. Uh, you have uh, a climax and you have the Daniel Moore. Okay, classic, right? English majors, I know there's one there this morning. Uh, in these two stories, the game-changing uh, innovation comes in. The car with the, all the arms or the voom, right? Something happens, is introduced, um, the, the game-changing innovation, and everything gets sorted out. And then the cat goes away, mom comes home, and everything's good. So we we pattern our the, the discussion after we've introduced the books and the stories and had them read them uh, to this. We we move them towards this. So uh, and I just tell them, hey, when you know the archaeological record now says that there were there were four or five species of humans alive at the same time, right? Archaeological record says that alive at the same time, not sequ not sequentially, right? They're alive at the same time. And one of the things the Homo sapiens, the big brain. One of the species. What was its? What was its greatest? It says here, ultimate weapon. What was its game-changing innovation? 
and I move them to this. This was our game changing innovation. These are international partners. So I move them from why are we, why are we reading this Gus to cooperation? And it's through art and it's through, it's through the cat in the hat because it's a nice on ramp. It's incredibly sticky. We refer to it through the rest of the course and we talk about cooperation. And so I've just stuck. Dr. Seuss is very sticky. I put cooperation on it and I, I give it to him and it works. And, and that's how I did it. And it wasn't like a, I, I understand the neuroscience of the three uh, the neurotransmitter or anything else. It was eight, it was, it was, you know, eight 30 on Sunday night. And I had no idea what I was going to do tomorrow. And I had to come up with something, but it works. And it's, it, and it's an art induced, uh, on ramp, uh, to a concept, which we want them to take away. And they do, they do a pretty good job. Okay. That's a great question. I, I'll give you, I'll, you know, I got, I got you 10 bucks later. Do I see a question over here? Ladies, did I, did I see a question? Okay. Well, I hope that was informative and, and helpful. And I, ma'am, I'll turn it over back to you. Uh, we still have time for one more question. Okay. Any one of you? <laughs> Sorry. So, Gus, I have a question. I know the answer, but I want the audience to hear. Um, when you introduced the topic of women, peace, and security in an international um, strategic leaders course that you um, host, what is their initial response to understanding the concepts within women, peace, and security mm. um, that you receive back from them? And does their response surprise you? It surprised me, but I want to hear your feedback. Yeah. Um, well, I, I do the U.S. strategy, right? I, and they, but they, as you've pointed, or somebody pointed out this morning on the panel in the Pringle Auditorium, you know, hey, this is this has been in the works globally for a long time. And, and, and these countries are no stranger to women, peace and security, either as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, a bumper sticker or a concept. And, and, and most of the countries we work with, uh, that are partner nations that come to our course are, are integrated. Some slower, some faster, uh, some have different experiences with women in positions of authority and leadership. Um, but they, uh, I will say that there, there's, there's a, um, it's not surprised that we have it in the course. And we, and I would show you a thing on, on the course. Uh, we, we talk about it all the time because, because again, because it's part of the whole business of war. And every Thursday though is, is, is a women, peace and security day. Every Thursday. I know you have a happy hour here, but there we have women, peace and security. And, uh, and the reason we do that is because you get these conversations that you, I, we need to spend time with this. Instead of having a little class here and a little comment here, hey guys, we got to go on because we got we spend a whole day, and we have to deep dive it, and they have to be exhausted. They have to think uh, through these things for them to say, okay, I'll take a piece of that, right? And so um, they're they're uh, some sometimes they are um, curious of why it's in the program. Why do we have this? We all know this, Gus. Why are we talking about it? Right, like, like we're finished, like we've, we've done enough to put out a, a strategy. We've done enough to put it in, in, in law. And we've, we've heard from early this morning till now, uh, that, uh, that's just not enough, right? We have to put it in practice. And as, uh, and as, as we say, um, uh, the Chinese word Dao, uh, the Japanese word Do is way, and it's not a way of going. It's a way of being. And so changing the way, as we talk about in our class, uh, how, how are you being, how are you being that we are spreading, uh, this virus about women, peace and security? Uh, someone called it a virus this morning. Um, but how are we doing that? How are you being not what you do, what you are, the to be verb. And so, uh, so that's what we, 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 we want to make it. So it's, it's a thing and they want to walk away again as a sticky thing. And I have a great example, which I, I I'm going to, I'm going to cheat. This is some of the stuff we do. Uh, black rhino poaching. Uh, we do rapid, rapid prototyping. Okay. So I, here, here's one thing. Uh, we've seen this come into, we build strategies at the end of the course. And the strategies are given uh, as presentations. And I... Uh, men listen to women. That came up as one of the reasons to put women in the strategy. Why is Siri a female voice? Why about Alexa? 
What about, so uh, these are the reasons they put these in a strategy. So are you being effective, Gus? Well, we're talking about it and our friends from SOCOM come and help us get this started. And we talk about it whole course and it ends up in the strategies that they produce at the end. And I, and I tell them, and here's, here's another one uh, that you may be, you may, so, and I'll read the, uh, the red. Uh, blah, blah, having developed a strategy to comprehensively empower women in our societies as a non-provocative, unconventional path and source of strategic leverage to rebalance our collective relationships with the great powers, namely Russia, the United States, and China. And these are medium and small-sized countries who have no choice, mainly in dialogue fans, right, but to suffer what they must. How do we do this? Cooperation, Gus. What do you want to cooperate on? Something that, that, that uh, blows up in the face of these big powers? Not a good choice. Well, let's find a non-provocative way. And so they, they incorporated empowerment of women to build community, to build cooperation among nations, and start from moving from a, a point of, of weakness to a point of, of advantage. So I'm, I'm very proud to see those things come about in the, in the strategies. Thank you, sir. Let's give him a good hand. Our next speaker, I'm sorry. Oh, just cheering. Yeah. Sorry, I just had one more brief question. Okay. Kind of I... related to the previous, if we have a second or no. Real quick, real quick. Gus, I just wanted you to ask you to share what is the biggest resistance or um, pushback that you receive from your students when bringing up WPS? Um, and what do you quickly say to that? Thank you. It's combat, combat, combat arms. Just exactly what we talked about today. Um, I don't have a good answer for them. I, I don't. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm all for. Trust me. I'm all for. Hey, if you can, if you can do it, you get in there. Uh, I do tell them this. I say, well, listen. Uh, we got uh, eleven thousand years of the uh, uh, of uh, the Holocene period, right? humans were developed the record says whatever um for i don't know ten thousand years of human history um it has been we have been based on physical strength that has been the power broker right is your physical strength um and it's our ability as men to counter friction and gravity and because we started this seven thousand years ago we captured key terrain, right? Men captured key terrain. We were presidents, we were the leaders of corporations, da, 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 da. So what happens in the future? Ma'am, cyber, what happens in the future? Is it physical strength? No, right? So we have to prepare. So this is the whole thing. They, they, they wonder why. What about combat arms? Rest? Well, I, I don't know. Figure it out. My point is, in 20 years, in one generation, it's going to change. Your job is to figure out how to lead there. And our job is to develop leaders who are prepared to lead in space where weight and friction, all stuff really cut and doesn't matter. And so they start to see, wow, we got to get ready for the future. Yeah. You have to get ready for the future and you have to have women. You can't start the pipeline of leaders. Like when we're in 20 years from now, right? You got to do it now. And uh, the pipeline that was being, the pipeline being small or uh, barely littered with women, right? The leadership pipeline uh, was the thing that brought up the comment they made today. But uh, that's the thing. What about combat, Gus? <laughs> okay, listen, it's going to change, right? It's going to change. And you have to, regardless of what you think, you've got to prepare leaders, give them that cognitive advantage, Admiral, uh, to lead in the future. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. That, that, that was a great question. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Command Master Chief Joseph Farney, and thank you for your patience, sir. No, the floor you. is yours. I appreciate that. I was fixing the dog Gus for this cheering session that he brought, but thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. There's a lot of things that I've learned today. Um, one of them was really uh, impressive uh, just a little while ago. Uh, I learned, for those of you that may not know this, I'll tell you so you don't do what I did, um, that these buttons on the jacket don't actually unbutton and open up this sleeve. And guess exactly when I figured it out, right? About the time I stuck this thing into that sleeve. 
right? Now you're half in, half out, and I don't know what to do. So we've worked this out. I've got a jacket on. I'm happy and, and really, really pleased. Uh, it also makes me very happy to listen to somebody say, hey, it was 830 at night and I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, so I did this. Um, that, you know, mine is like, it's 830 in the morning. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm gonna, I did this. Um, I have been predisposed to women, peace and security since about uh, 1979. Uh, my mother and my aunt both owned beauty salons. And if you are a young cisgender heteronormative male, there is no better place in society than work uh, as a teenage boy than that kind of a construct. And what I saw in those spaces and places were women that were leading, that women that were in spaces and places that were taking charge and doing the things that they uh, should as matriarchs of their families and of their communities. And I saw efficient people operating well in those spaces. 12 years after I joined the Navy, I was then again asked to go and represent uh, U.S. Submarine Forces Pacific on a panel for the Women in Submarines Project. And I am kidding you not, for almost a year, sitting in a room, watching people wring their hands about what are we going to do when the girls show up to the submarine, right, was stunning. Guess who was absent from that conversation? Women, right? Say it isn't so, you know? And, and it, it took almost a year to get women in that conversation. And I could swear to you, um, the only thing that kept going through my mind is, I don't know how many of these men have sisters. I don't know how many of these men have daughters. I don't know how many of these men have wives, but I do know they all have mothers, right? And, and what would it look like if that conversation, if the WPS conversation had been as relevant and as, um, I guess, prevalent at that time, um, I, th I think we'd have probably been more effective warfighters. I think we'd have been more effective at combat. And I think it would have made uh, a bigger difference to the world much, much sooner. To think a little bit about culture, um, I've got a couple of slides here to, to show. Um, I would offer that the slides are less meaningful than your engagement with me and vice versa. Um, I do think it's important that we all understand or at least come from a position of commonality when we talk about culture of inclusion. Um, I didn't really get fascinated with cultures of inclusion until as a strike group command master chief, I had the opportunity to look at 13,500 sailors and compare apples to apples, squadrons to squadrons, DDGs to DDGs, cruisers to cruisers, aircraft carriers to aircraft carriers. And in that compare and contrast, start looking at organizations that were thriving in support of their people, that were meeting all of their measures of effectiveness, that were doing all of the things that they should be doing. Their people were promoting happy, uh, non-attributional or correction, um, unplanned losses were not uh, prevalent in the organizations. And then other organizations who might have measured uh, meet, met their measures of effectiveness, but did so on the backs of their people. And I started looking very heavily at what was the difference between those two organizations. And it's easy to say that it might be the leader or the commanding officer. It's easy to say that it might be the command triad or the department uh, heads or the wardroom or the chief's mess. But what I found and what I'll share with you today are some things that I think are fundamental to the fabric of the entire group. And I would ask as facilitators in this organization and as faculty and professionals in this space that you consider some of these uh, as we move along, okay? Key enablers for cultures of inclusion. I took about 155 uh, different attributes and started looking very closely at what, uh, what they had in common, what they had in difference. And I started kind of binning them into different genres. And I came up with these, um, uh, these what I call key enablers. I would readily admit that these are some key enablers, not all key enablers, and this is a way to look at this, not the way to look at this. Your way may be different in your classrooms. It may be different in your squadrons or your submarines or your military treatment facilities, right? It may be different. Uh, your uh, grayed out words might be big and bold on your slide, and my big and bold might be grayed out on your slide. But these were the things that I found out of that 155 or so attributes that in the absence of or in the presence of, we saw cultures in organizations that were inclusive or cultures in organizations that were dying. And what is stunning to me as I talk about this list, over four years at the Naval Leadership and Ethics Center, 
to every commanding officer, executive officer, command master chief, chief of the boat and spouse, everyone in those rooms looked at that list and said, yeah, of course, absolutely. That makes perfectly good sense to me. I understand that. That's what we do. Really? Then why are 50% of the commands just not thriving? You know, what, what is it that is preventing, if you believe that to be true and you espouse that that is the right idea, right, what is it that prevents us from doing it? So I would ask you to consider those as you take a look at uh, cultures of inclusion. I think that if cultures of inclusion and key enablers are uh, properly aligned in an organization and properly aligned in the mindset of a leader of an organization, that you come up with learning cultures. Now, for this audience, learning cultures are what you do. It's part of the fabric of who you are as an educator, as an academic. It's a part of the fabric of those of you that are practitioners in the space around culture and inclusion. But the reality is learning cultures challenge the status quo. They're disruptive. They cause frustration. They create environments where people are uncomfortable. And in that uncomfortable uncomfortability, they struggle with trying to figure out what is the next move? What do I say? How do I say it? When do I say it? What happens if I say the wrong kind of things? My experience as a command master chief over 17 years, looking at organizations that create learning cultures, what I find is that people are addressing the chain of command more frequently and more often with ideas that are meaningful to the fight with ideas that are meaningful to fighting and winning our nation's wars, and with ideas that ultimately translate to this space that we talk about with women, peace, and security today. Prior to March of 2020, I taught this lesson roughly 60 times. I wrote it in late 2017. And it was a lesson that was relatively well received after March of 2020 and that summer and the following January, teaching the same material to the same audiences, the tone changed. And it went from a tone about culture of inclusion to a conversation about DEI and DEI became very polarizing very quickly. What I would offer to you, and it's been mentioned several times today, so I won't beat up on it is that DEI and WPS are certainly complementary behaviors and complementary efforts. But DEI has a much wider aperture in terms of the number of people, the types of people, the flavor of people, the individuals that we would ask for you to consider as inclusive parts of your organization, where what WPS is a policy framework and an important one. So to answer, hopefully, a question that was asked earlier, right? when we think about the counter arguments to WPS, these are the types of things that I see. I hear people talk about lethality. I hear talk about uh, uh, WPS being a political agenda. Uh, I hear things like women not being physically suited for combat, which I would challenge, as Gus has already done so, um, I, our idea of combat is changing r- rapidly. So that is changing. The inclusion of women may disrupt unit cohesion. The WPS agenda, agenda diverts resources for more pressing military priorities. And the WPS agenda undermines meritocracy in the military. As practitioners in this space and as educators in this institution, I think you should develop your own thought processes behind these counter arguments. I expect that you will hear them in your classrooms. I expect that you should be able to address them when they come up. And I expect that you think back to this lesson and remember that Master Chief Farney told you, you should expect to be able to answer these questions, right? It's really, really important to do that. So as part of that mechanism, while you formulate those thoughts, I've asked, I've got two slides here that I'll show you effective approaches for leaders. And then another way that you might bring in the WPES conversation. In institutions that understand WPS, they are very, very effective at connecting WPS 
to operational effectiveness. They understand how to do that. They can show very tactically on what that looks like for an institution, right? What, it, what happens when you have individuals in an organization that come to work every day belonging and feeling like they can be the best version of themselves um, and how effective they can be in the battle space when you do that. So those organizations can tie WPS to operational effectiveness. They can provide practical examples. This morning's plenary session, we heard about female engagement teams, and I would argue and make even a stronger argument that there are absolutely places and spaces that you will never have access to if you do not have female engagement teams, period. Full stop. We are a lot of things, men, but we are not able to, pers to, to puncture some of that, right? And if you don't have women in female engagement teams to build critical intelligence for you, you're not going to get it. Okay. Effective approaches for leadership to understand how to build uh, training and resources and understand why that is a priority in your institution. One of the most damaging things I think we can do to DEI efforts, to inclusion efforts, or to WPS is to talk and espouse how we believe about it, but not put the resources, training, and agenda behind it. Okay. Remarkably different. Thank you. That's a great group you brought with you, Gus. Okay. And then finally, on this slide, encouraging collaboration. I think that that's what we are doing in this room. Right. I've watched the WPS agenda just here at the War College in a couple of years morph to something that was really good, to something that is outstanding. To have all of you in this room thinking about hard problems and what you might take back to your classroom and how you might address these issues is meaningful, is deliberate, and it is purposeful. And in fact, it is collaborative. I am not one for buzzwords. I abhor T-shirts that have, you know, every chief season, we put T-shirts on our back, says lead by example, right? Deck plate leaders. Sometimes that stuff is fantastic. In this case, I would say it's not optional. Leaders in an organization cannot be insufficiently fascinated with the WPS agenda. They must lead by example. They must be able to walk the talk. They must be able to demonstrate their commitment to gender equality and inclusion through their actions and decision makings. And when they make a mistake, they must be able to say, I messed this up. How can I do it better? That is what about the, uh, the educational process is all about, is your students being able to do the same thing in your classroom. Making mistakes, learning, growing, falling forward. Making mistakes, learning, growing, falling forward. Essential contributions include integration of the gender perspectives, inc incorporating gender considerations into all aspects of planning, execution, assessment, and military operations. There was a question in the last ses session that was, I, I hazard to paraphrase, but essentially the question was, can you show me examples of where women in the planning process made a difference? I would challenge you to show me where women absent from the planning process doesn't get you your end state quicker, faster, and more effectively. Creating safe and inclusive environments, and I'll show you a, a couple of ways that we might look at that. Promoting female representation, being advocates for the recruitment of uh, the retention and the advancement of female service members within their commands. I had an opportunity for the first time ever um, despite being in the Navy for 33 years, I had an opportunity this past summer to go to the Naval Academy as they were forming uh, the battalion. And I looked across the 1,100 plebes at the Naval Academy, and it quite literally was an eye-watering moment for me to look at a group of individuals, 1,100 strong, from all walks of life, from all socioeconomic backgrounds, all colors, all genders. It was unbelievably rewarding. But diversity is nothing without a culture of inclusion. And I wonder what it will look like in a dozen or so years when those folks are department heads. Will we have the same kind of representation? Will we have the same kind of people at the table? So something to consider. I would offer that there is a rubric for WPS. I'm not fully sure how to quantify this, 
but I can provide some uh, qualitative assessment. So I'll just go through a, a handful of slides here and ask you to take this with you when you go. In terms of a rubric, integrating WPS and cultures of inclusion, again, a whole lot of overlap there, starts with this awareness and education, being able to incorporate WPS and cultures of inclusion into everything that you do is going to be very important. And I'm not talking about spinning the plate, checking the box, and then walking off and letting the plate fall. I'm talking about in your organizations, in your classrooms, how often do you talk about it? With what periodicity does it happen? How loud do you beat the drum? How frequently do you get after it? In Gus's institution, I love the idea that every Thursday, that's a thing, right? That is exactly what we're talking about when we do this. Leadership commitment, encouraging leaders to championship, champion WPS, cultures of inclusion initiatives, and set the tone for their organizations. Right. Policy development and implementation. What do your policies related to gender equality, women, peace, and security, and cultures of inclusion look like? How do your people know that you stand for that? Or how do they know that you don't, which might be a more telling question? What metrics and accountability might you use to look at WPS in an organization, and how do you hold the individuals accountable? And more importantly, you know, I know what it looks like for our organization here at the War College, but what does it look like for your classroom? How does that work in your places and spaces? Collaboration and partnerships. Encouraging collaboration, and Gus hit this so well earlier, WPS is an outward-facing mission. Right? Um, again, one of the questions in the last sessions was, you know, how do you uh, engage with other countries? What do we take from their best practices to look at our WPS initiatives? I would say that that collaboration is two-way, and it's, uh, well, actually, it's more than two-way. It's unidirectional or multidirectional. Communication and advocacy, developing a communication strategy, and then perhaps most important, continuous improvement. So when I go into an organization, I start looking at the things that make organizations effective. These are the kinds of things that I'm looking at. Some of this is really, really easy to look at. You have a five-inch gun. You have a target. How many times you shoot the target? How many times you hit the target? That's your measure of effectiveness. The question that I would ask for you is how do you know your people are ready to shoot that gun every single day when the time calls? And if you're not using a rubric like this to look at these kinds of things, I think you might be surprised when it comes time. Okay. All right. This is an exercise that I have done for about seven years now um, to really kind of look at privilege and the, and the role of privilege uh, and how that might play with organizations. I'll give you just a second to read that. Now, to punish those of you that sat in the back of the room who have to pass this exam to get your exit ticket, there is your quiz. This is a modified version of an exercise that I've been using for quite some time to look at privilege. There are 27 statements. 14 on this slide, 13 on the next slide. And when you have an opportunity to get the slide deck, I would ask you to do it um, in your office or in your uh, area where you most often reflect. Questions like, if you have never been discriminated based on your gender, add one point been told that you were not masculine or feminine enough based on your gender, add one point. Been denied access to education based on your gender, add one point. Had to change your behavior appearance to avoid unwanted attention or harassment based on your gender, add one point.
For the second set of attributes, they include things like, if you have never identified as a woman of color, add one point. If you have never experienced adverse childhood experiences of of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, add one point. If you have never been denied the opportunity to participate in peacekeeping, security-related activities based on your gender, add one point. It is interesting to me that the higher your score, let's say it's in the range of 25 or so, which would probably be my score, that you are most positioned to impact women, peace, and security. And the lower your score, closer to zero, you are most likely to be impacted by a lack of women, peace, and security. And that is true in this country as it is true abroad. I had a professor. I hope that he is watching me. Hi, Dr. Hall. I had a professor that once said, if it doesn't get measured, it can't be managed. And I hated it. Mainly because I hate SPSS, but whatever. So I went and looked up the quote that he used to use and found out that it was not true. What the real quote came from was what gets measured gets managed, even when it is pointless to measure and manage it, and even if it harms the purpose of the organization to do so. I don't know what your rubric should look like when you are measuring cultures of effectiveness or cultures of inclusion. I don't know what your measures of effectiveness should be. I have some ideas about what that looks like. And as a command master chief, walking into an organization and being able to grab a cup of coffee and go down and sit with sailors and find out what's going on in an organization, I can do that pretty well. I get a felt sense for what's happening. But I think it is far more important to understand where you influence women, priests, and security and cultures of inclusion than it is to provide some measurement to somebody up the chain of command that says, we've checked all these boxes and we're good. So just consider that. The enablers, as I mentioned, when present, can assist leaders in creating learning cultures, and those learning cultures support both culture of inclusion and, by extension, the WPS agenda. And if there was one bumper sticker that I would ask you to take out of here, is that bottom one. Diversity without a culture of inclusion is not only a hypocritical maneuver, but it is also wasteful and dangerous. It puts lives at risk. Thank you very much.